Um, hello from me. Thanks again for inviting us. Uh, it's really inspiring, uh, inspiring for me to to see that so many people are are um, working on on this issue with so many different approaches and also critical approaches. So it's really pleasure to, pleasure to be here. Uh, the paper. Uh, which we're going to present as a joint uh, work of Celia Klepp and me. And Celia did uh, empirical work in Curie Bus, which she's going to present soon. And I had a look at some of the documents uh, which have been produced within the uh, context of the European Union. Um, okay, what have we been doing? First of all, we've, we've approached the issue of environmental change and migration from, from the more or less theoretical debates uh, a review, and we soon realized that from our view, there's there's some shortcomings uh, in those debates. First, first of all, and I think all of you uh, know about that. Um, often, research on the on the environment migration nexus neglects the, the social, uh, cultural, and also the wider economic arrangements in which um, migration de decisions are embedded. Um, at the same time, here's uh, well. Our main approach, at the same time, we believe with the political implications of the debate and also uh, the role of the figure, for example, of the climate migrants in uh, in various policy processes is often uh, neglected um, and is not in the focus of the of the debates. And in doing this and having a closer look in the, in the political agendas, which are also maybe behind some of the contributions. We try to maybe give a short uh, answer or, or try to look into which, which has been questioned or, or the question which has been raised this morning, where is the political? Um, although after hearing uh, Colum's contribution today, it might also feel a little bit like beating the Wakamo or what did you <laughs> call it today when looking at the, at the European Union? Um, we think uh, that the issue of climate change and migration uh, to some uh, regard is like a burning glass in which uh, questions of climate justice are, are quite obvious and, and show in showing the his historical responsibilities uh, of the OECD world more or less for current and future social con consequences of global climate change. Um, for this reason, we think that the debates on climate change and, and migration uh, are to be or can be understood as new arenas of negotiation, as we, as we have put it, um, uh, in which you know, questions of climate or, or wider ecolo ecological justice, and to some extent also questions of post-colonial justice, as Celia might point out later, um, are, are negotiated and recognition of new rights and old responsibilities are, are, are fought. At the same time, we see that on a global level there's a clear absence of uh, policy, as, as Karen McNamara has put it, um, which shows that up to now, to now, those struggles have not been institutionalized uh, on, in global policy forum. Um, what we wanted to do now in our research is to, to lay uh, open how the, how the issue is uh, communicated and nego negotiated in two arenas of negotiation, namely the European Union on the one hand and um, the Pacific on the other, specifically uh, Kiribati and, and the relations with uh, New Zealand. Um, the reason why we picked those two arenas is that uh, in light of the current discourses, both areas are to a more or less extent uh, touched by the question of climate change induced migration. Um, according to, to, to projections um, on the extent on, and on potential hotspots of uh, changing migratory patterns, but also according to, to statements of, the, of EU institutions themselves, Europe could be among one of the hotspots um, as potential receiving areas as respective migrations. And on the other hand, uh, as we already have heard, the Pacific Islands are among the areas which are perceived or are, are constructed uh, as potential first victims of global climate change. Um, our aim now has been to reconstruct how the issue is negotiated in those two ar arenas and 
we have to admit and we're fully aware of that we are looking at two completely different uh, set of actors and our aim has not been to make a direct comparison between the two cases but to to contrast the negotiation, negotiations in the two fields. So I'm going to give a short overview of what has been happening within the EU system. Um, most important to say, uh, uh, to start with, is that so far the, the issue of climate change and migration is uh, rather a niche concern, as Somerville had, has put it recently, although and you already pointed towards the, the most recent study, um, the debate somehow accelerated over the last couple of months or years. Uh, there has been a, re a recent uh, paper of the EU Commission on the issue. Um, nevertheless, I think traces of the debate can be found, found in several policy contexts of the European Union, and we identified like four fields in which uh, um, the, the debate pops up. Um, first, there would be individual attempts to discuss the issue of the European Parliament. Second, the global approach to migration and mobility, um, in which the issue um, is, is debated. Um, third, the Union's development context or development aid. And a fourth, the issue has also been discussed in the context of, the se of potential security challenges uh, of cl climate change uh, for the European Union. Um, first, the single initiatives of EU parliamentarians. You see here uh, a, a broad timeline of events that have been ha happening since 2002. Um, much of the debate, the early debate has been uh, has been coined by a, a British EU parliamentarian. Uh, she she uh, put the uh, the issue on the agenda already in 2002 uh, and had the clear aim to establish a legal category of climate refugees and to offer protection me measures and humanitarian assistance to affected people. Um, so far, those initiatives and all of you know about that. Um, have not been crowned with, with success and, the, and have not been taken up by an official recognition of climate change, migrants or refugees by the European Union. Um, uh, within the, the, the global approach to migration and, mo and mobility, to give a, sh a short introduction, uh, focuses on the external or the externally defined dimensions of migration to the Union and especially targets on so-called strategic partnerships uh, with the Mediterranean neighbors in Northern Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, in those strategic partnerships, there's, there's a clear focus uh, on migration management. We've been talking about that before. That means the facilitation of wanted or legal migration and the um, prevention of illegal migration, whatever uh, EU thinks is illegal. Uh, this externalization of migration policies uh, and also the, the underlying management approach in general have been heavily criticized, uh, especially with regard to ensuring human rights and uh, refugee rights. Um, so far, I think it's not clear yet what exactly the role of the climate migration debate within the global approach to migration and mobility will be. Um, but I think there's indication, and I think this is, belief, uh, this is uh, very important, there are no signs that the, that the debate within the global approach to migration and mobility is going to lead to a renegotiation in any way of, of the categories of legal or illegal migration, as, as the EU puts it. Um, I think in light of the, of the general direction of the, of the GAM, it's more likely that the issue will rather be part of this externalization of uh, border control and migration management and the ten tendency of an outsourcing of the migration problem to partner countries. Uh, the third area is the devel development cooperation of the European Union in, in which the issue has been debated already in 2003. Uh, a paper by the Europe 
European Commission um, they are briefly re referred to the migration question. Um, so far the issue has, has been cropping up, up in some, um, some documents in the development aid context, for example in the thematic program on cooperation with third countries in the areas of migration and asylum. I think the point is that so far there's no concrete measures that have been derived from, from the debate. Uh, rather the communication of the issue is quite vague. Um, as a recent statement by the Directorate General Development and Cooperation shows, I'm quoting, the thematic program, program will therefore support initiatives addressing climate change and use migratory <coughs> flows, in particular in the countries and regions most concerned by such a phenomenon. Um, first thing, rather back, they're not uh, saying what exactly they, they will uh, support. And second, here again, the issue is again explicitly outsourced. Uh, the last area in which, which the issue has, has been de debated is the, the security sector. Um, this is, of course, also uh, the most problematic one. Um, the High Representative of the Commission in 2008 published a report on the security implications of climate change in general, in, in which the migration question played a, a quite prominent role. It was uh, conceptualized as one of several config for configurations uh, through which the security situation of the EU is threatened by climate change, uh, as it is obvious uh, in this quote. Environmentally induced migration may increase conflicts in transit and destination areas. Europe must expect substantially increased mi migratory pressure. Um, coming from that was the um, proposal of the uh, of the com of the high representative to um, that unions climate policies should not be limited to to the classical instruments of mitigation and adaptation but also be considered in defense and security policies and I think this confirms what, 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 what we've been discussing earlier today um, that the climate migrant figure can represent uh, a threat to the present order as, as you put it Earlier. Okay, to sum up, quickly sum up this, this first section before Celia will report of Kiribas. Um, I think it became clear or maybe clearer that the EU discourses of climate change and migration are so far uh, dominated by foreign security and development actors, and consequently, the issue is fundamentally outsourced and even delegated to the responsibility of partner countries through this. Um, um, uh, those, uh, partnerships with, with third countries. Um, in light of the discursive arrangements in which the issue is negotiated, we believe that the climate change migration nexus will rather reinforce uh, exclusive migration policies and the externalization of border control and migration management than contributing to a renegotiation of the de definitory line between legal and illegal mi migration. And furthermore, this then I can hand over to you. Furthermore, the statement so far like any relation to climate justice, thoughts, or rhetorics. Thank you, Johannes. So now we try to overcome with the European perspective um, and try to see the negotiation process in Oceania. By the way, maybe we all we should have put a question mark behind the title "New Rights for Climate Migrants in Oceania." <coughs> so, um, because of course it's still an open negotiation process, and also a big question if there will be a more em emancipatory approach in in this region of the world. So, uh, Kiribati is located in the Central Pacific and it's an atoll island nation which consists of 32 atoll islands. It has 110,000 inhabitants. It is independent since 1979 from Great Britain. And before it was uh, Ellis Island and Tuvalu, which formed the Gilbert Islands. And uh, what is interesting, of course, in this uh, case is that it is a nation state that don't even have, have a, like a bigger brother or bigger sister, like many other 
countries in this region, like many other Pacific islands. Um, I want to stress that Kiribati has several environmental problems. Um, here, I don't know if you can see that. You can see the rubbish in the lagoon. One of the major problems is that uh, Kiribati has no sewage and no uh, garbage system. So, um, yeah, apart from climate change, there are several other severe problems. And, um, yeah, the effects today of climate change, I would say they're contested. Actually, sometimes I also try to, to ask what can we see today, and people were very reluctant. Um, some were pointed me some sites, others said, uh, some scientists said that Probably it's, it's very unclear today what we can already see, maybe some coral bleaching, but apart from this, it's still very difficult to say uh, today what is affected by climate change, which environmental changes. But of course, we also know that uh, low-lying atoll islands are vulnerable. Scientists uh, predict that they will have more severe storms, rising sea levels, and more droughts. And especially in Kiribati, the fresh water lands is at risk. That could be also the first effect that is, could really make the islands in, inhabitable. Um, on the map, or, or on, on this picture, you can also see that uh, Kiribati is really a strip in the ocean. So that, of course, also makes rising sea levels a big problem. And most people even are living on, on the coast. Everybody's living on the coast, actually. So yeah, this, of course, uh, could make Kiribati very vulnerable to climate change. The president, Arnaud de Tong, is very active in making Kiribati's future destiny public. Um, I will quote from the UN World Env Environment Day 2008 in Wellington. What he said was, uh, none of the atolls that make up our country are more than two meters above sea level. We will be submerged by the end of the century as things stand right now. But what happens before is equally devastating. Anti-villages are being relocated as the sea encroaches up on the land. People are being asked to move from places that have been home for them. It's a human tragedy." End of quote. So what we can say that uh, Kiribati is today perceived as a claim climate change poster child as many consultants and development um, agents also told me in, in interviews, for example. So it's a, it's a symbol, so to say, for climate change discourses and, of course, also for climate change and, and migration. What makes it even more being a symbol, but also being a pioneer, sort of, is that it is the first country that is developing migration strategies for all of its citizens. So it has a very yeah, specific approach to, to handle these uh, predictions and these possible futures of the islands. So to give you a short insight into my research, which is still at the beginning, I will have to go back to Kiribati for several months in the future. Now I just stayed there for uh, about a month. Um, my focus of the research of the research is processes of lawmaking bottom up and general changes of values and norms <coughs> in the context of climate change, which I had the impression in Kiribati were very strong. And my research questions are which claims do the government and the people of Kiribati formulate? What are their strategies and who are their allies to achieve these claims? And another question is, how is, a, is the government of Kiribati able to rule a country that it is predicted to disappear? Because my impression was also that, of course, these strong predictions have very big implications for the whole government, uh, governance of the islands. Um, a short, um, yeah, m like my, my theoretical background is, um, or how I try to capture these questions is uh, what I call legal anthropology of emergence. So um, here law setting processes uh, from below are studied, um, which is important that here I can also capture informal actors and informal forums where law is negotiated. It also captures soft law approaches. Um, which are quite prominent in the region on climate uh, 
change in migration. Um, what is also very important is that different epistemic communities and diverse legal sources can be captured. Because, of course, in all these Pacific islands, we have a situation of legal pluralism. There are also local and uh, regional um, power systems come into, come into question, of course. And what is also, uh, yeah, it's also very useful to repoliticize the whole uh, research on climate change adaptation. Um, because, as we already heard today, often it's discussed in a very apolitical way. Uh, shortly on the migrate with dignity strategy, I've, I won't t say about it very much, maybe later in the discussion or, or later this evening I can say more about it. What is important is that, uh, of course, external migration options are cost considered clearly as an adaptation strategy. The Kiribati people don't want a refugee status, they want to be stay self-determined. Um, the whole, the, like the strategy is called by the president's office, migrate and more on merit and with dignity. And it, it, it includes relocation of communities and in individual labor migration. Um, and right now, the government of Kiribati is actually already uh, negotiating different labor programs, mostly with Australia and New Zealand. And here we have, for example, uh, I'll give you just one example. Um, it's called the Pacific Access category here um, from different countries, also from Tuvalu and Tonga and Kiribati. Um, about 200 people can come to New Zealand, 75 from Kiribati every year. What is important is that they have to be well educated and they have to be uh, not over 45 years old. So here you can already see that these labor programs can be very selective mm -hmm. and for sure not only have an emancipatory approach. And they smoke? Sorry? Um, what is interesting is that in my interview with the Ministry of Labor in Kiribati, I also found out that they have different negotiations going on even in Croatia and in Canada. So I was quite astonished that it's not only in the region but also in other countries. And what is also very interesting is that, of course, Kiribati is always labeling it as climate change migration very clearly. Mm -hmm. I was also re-asking re this in the interviews. And definitely countries like Australia and New Zealand are labeling, labeling it as um, labor migration programs. So here we can see a clear contrast in, in, the, in the framing of these uh, programs. There's a clear contrast. Some little pre-results from my research in Kiribati. Um, it is very difficult to balance the policies between future and present generations, the interests of the future and present generations. Temporalities, of course, come very much into, into the question. Um, <coughs> my impression was also that the migrate with dignity strategy could have very severe side effects that are very difficult to manage. For example, the first one could be a very harsh brain drain because, of course, these programs are so selective. Also, less sustainable uh, use of resources and maybe also less investments in the future. Um, but, on the other hand, we can already observe that Kiribati has a stronger voice on the global level right now and that it's also already gaining from remittances. So we have positive and negative effects, I guess, and side effects. Um, I guess, to conclude this part, I think regional processes, negotia negotiation processes in, in the Pacific seem to be promising, but still, of course, the industrialized countries are very much rejecting the label of climate change migration or also showing more solidarity with uh, climate change migrants in the future. And maybe we should also question how fair it is to, to reduce it just to a regional approach, because of course, here are really very much global questions that are concerned. Definitely, I will follow this uh, research in the future. 
So this, these are just uh, pre results, and now I will come more to the overall results. We have definitely seen that we have a different framing of discourses in the EU and Oceania. That is not very surprising, <laughs> probably. Um, so in the EU, we have probably an externalization of responsibilities, a humanitarization of the discourse, and no legal framing, definitely. Mm -hmm. In Oceania, I think we can see very much that the topic of climate change and migration shows the entanglement of climate justice aspects of North-South relations and post-colonial discourses. Again, this burning glass that uh, Johannes had before. And we think that the, um, to find solutions for climate change related topics, also for example in the UN FCCC negotiations, we have, we have to relate these topics very much more to climate justice aspects, also to, to talk amongst all actors on an eye level um, approach. So this acknowledgement we think would be very important. What needs to be done? We put it in this very, <laughs> um, yeah, in this image. Um, we think that we need very much more power sensitive research on climate change and migration. Also on climate change adaptation. For example, these adaptation programs right now in Kiribati have a huge impact on power relations. It was my, my impression, for example, traditional power systems could be very much uh, yeah, swapped away because uh, the whole framing of climate change science, for example, of course, is a very Western discourse. That's just a footnote. Um, I would have loved to talk about this more, but it was not possible here today. So of course, also local knowledge and local power systems must be much more included uh, in the research, but also in potential resettlement and, and adaptation programs. And in the end, we really would think that, uh, uh, that it would be necessary to repo repoliticize climate change, climate change research, to overcome a no policy and the humanitarian framing, and to re facilitate responsible and fair adaptation policies and a more open discourse on the whole subject. Thank you very much.